look at that real quick and grab a pen. So what I want you to do is circle which class you're coming to Wednesday night. This is a fantastic lineup that Steve and others have put together. Uh, Tom Brown's going to be doing a class called Making Strong Men. It's more than just coming to class. We've got an active men's ministry and appreciate the leadership that Tom is providing. So it, it's more than just learning about becoming a strong man in Christ, but it's about building relationships with other guys that are putting this ministry together. Uh, growth in Prayer in the Spirit, led by Tom Carter. I go in from time to time to this group. It's just refreshing being with them and learning more about the Holy Spirit and spending time cultivating that aspect of our faith. Catherine Burgess also always has a, a great class, and a, you know, it's open for all, living victoriously in difficult times. Please go go check out Catherine's class, and uh, I I've been kind of banned from this class, but there is a group of people that can sing, uh, that come with Lincoln, and you don't have to be on the praise team in the rotation just to come and enjoy. If you want to lift up uh, our Lord in, in praise, come be a part of that. And then I'm also excited about one of our new teachers, Daniel Kaufman's going to be doing a class on spiritual disciplines, which kind of ties in with this sermon series that we've been doing. So if this is something that intrigues you. Come learn about some more, but I, I, I'm hoping Daniel's going to encourage us to actually try some of these things out and, and learn from them. Esther sat in her room in the royal palace. There she was. She hadn't been married all that long, and she gets word that Mordecai, her older cousin, was down at the gate to the palace. He was there outside, and he was kind of protesting He's in sackcloth, he's covered himself in ash, and the reports that she gets from her servants are is that Mordecai is upset and he's weeping bitterly, and he, he's calling for you. So she sends a servant down and says, find out what's going on with Mordecai. Because Mordecai was more than just a cousin. He was the only father uh, figure that Esther had, the, the man that raised him. And so here she is in the palace, she sends word, the servant comes back and says, Mordecai has a message for you. The, the vile Haman has convinced your husband, King Xerxes, that, that we're a threat. The Jewish people have to be wiped out. We, we don't have any other options. Esther, it, it, if it's going to, to happen, you've got to do something. Here, here's a copy of the edict that says, on this day, all the Jews will be killed. Who knows if the Lord puts you in a position for just a time as this? Well, there's two problems with this situation. Number one is King Xerxes had no idea that his new bride was a member of the Jewish community. And that number two, Xerxes had a rule that anyone comes in unannounced into, into my courtroom and, and, and comes into the palace area without being summoned, you're put to death unless my golden scepter extends a pardon to you. And it had been 30 days since the king had called for his bride, Esther, and now she's put in a position. What, what messages, what, what things were going on in Esther's mind as she's, she's processing this? Well, in, in times of extreme danger, in times of extreme stress, the, the normal reaction that is sent, our natural instinct, is either fight or flight. So either you muster up all that you can to offer up a resistance to those that are coming after you, or if resistance is futile, well, then you flee. You grab what you can, and you get out as quick as possible. So that's what her brain is processing. Which one? Should I tell them to fight? Should I tell them to fly? And it, it, so she's going through all this. What does she do? Esther chapter 4 and verse 15 says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. She's in this crisis, and she's there. What do I do? And, and should, should, we, should we try to, 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 to fight against this, or, or, or should we leave? And she's going back, I'm just going to take three days. And though the text doesn't say it, I sure they accompany their, their fast with prayers before God. Lord, we're, we're your chosen people. We're in a jam. Please hear our cries. And for three days, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to offer it up to God and see what direction. I, I feel like he's prompting me through 
this spiritual advisor, this man that cares for me, to go in there. That's not what I want to do, but I feel like God's leading me there. And after three days, if, if I don't feel any different, tell more to God, that's what I'm going to do. What is this whole fasting thing about? Why do we even talk about this? What is the discipline of fasting? Well, in the Bible, we see great men and women of faith that choose to do this from time to time. You know, even Jesus chose to forego food, and sometimes they also forego water and for various reasons. If that's so, we see great women and men of faith doing this. Why is it kind of falling out of vogue? It, is it that we like food? Well, yeah, I mean, but why do we choose to look at the discipline and go, you know what, I heard of that, and I know great men and women of faith at, at times of crisis or times of decisions and, and, and other crossroads are go, I, I'm going to take some time. I, I, I'm not even going to eat. I'm just going to keep lifting this up before God, and, and maybe he's going to lead us or guide us or direct us. If we see that, why do we kind of shelve this discipline, saying, I'm not even going to experiment with that. That's not something I'm interested in. Uh, I'm going to keep reading the Bible and, and praying. What is so unique about fasting? Well, before we look at some of the reasons and benefits of fasting, I want to kind of pull the car over, so to speak. That's what my dad used to say when we are fighting in the back. I'm going to pull the car over. Okay, I want to pull the car over on this sermon series because I'm beginning a lot of feedback. And sometimes it's in the form of emails, and others just conversations on, on campus. And so we're a few weeks into this talk about spiritual disciplines, and I'm getting two reactions. The first is, what a blessing that we're trying some of this out. I've never heard sermons talking about this, and this is wonderful. And I've been kind of trying and experimenting, and my faith is going deeper. I, I've heard reports of, of folks that are going out on, on uh, bike rides in the morning and just spending an hour in prayer with God. Others are going on, on fast from media and just saying, I mean, I'm shutting off everything, and it's been wonderful. The other reaction is, why are we spending time talking about spiritual acts? I fought my whole life against work-based righteousness and earning my salvation. And now you're kind of putting this out there, so if I do it, I'm going to feel a sense of pride, but if I don't do it, I'm going to feel a sense of guilt. And why are we even doing this? Well, I'm, I want us to kind of look at things for just a minute and, and, and see why this is important. First, we, we need to kind of get some terms out there. One is justification. It's similar to salvation. And this comes from God through the saving act of Jesus dying on the cross. And I think to a man and a woman in here, we can all say that we can't do anything to earn that justification. In, in, in the court of law, there, we've been found guilty. Only Jesus has been found righteous. And it's that righteousness that was, was born on the cross that we line up against. And, and so we line up behind Jesus as we're walking through the line, and the Lord sees him and his righteousness. That's how we're justified. And so through justification, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. Amen? Okay? And, and so through that justification from our Heavenly Father, We've been promised something. We've been promised a home for all eternity. But Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, so we understand that. And Paul tells us in, in Romans 8, verse 30, that those he justified, he's also going to glorify. So that's what's on the other end. So if, if you look, we have justification. That's what happened in, in the past. God saving act, sending his son for us. And, and we know that we will be saved from the presence of sin when we go into heaven. Okay? So those are kind of the two bookends of our faith. So we have to kind of get this down. And we know that we will be made perfect in this perfect environment in heaven. What do we do between those two events? The second coming or when we're called home and when we've been saved through joining with Jesus in the death, burial, and resurrection. What do we do? Well, that's sanctification. The process of becoming more like Christ and overcoming the power of sin in our lives. Paul talks about being made holy. It's a process. That's what spiritual disciplines are designed to help us with. Not with the justification, not to get us into heaven, but to help us be more effective in this life right now. 
what we do in between. Philippians 2 and verse 12 through 13 says, Therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation. You've already been given it with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. God's got a plan for our life. God's got some stuff he wants us to do. But we can't go about doing those things as long as we're impure and living according to the old ways. He says, I've got some stuff, but I want you to be in the moving towards becoming more like my son Jesus. That's not going to happen until the second coming. But in the process, you're becoming less like the world, more like me. That's what we're striving for. Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 10, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just about getting to heaven. It's bringing heaven as heaven's representatives in his kingdom here on earth. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're striving towards as kingdom bearers, the ones that are pointing to a greater reality that will take place on the other side in the world to come. That's what we're talking about. Spiritual disciplines are simply a tool used by God-fearing brothers and sisters to make themselves available for God to begin this work in their lives, not to earn our way to heaven, but to proclaim the story of the one that makes it possible. Well, let's look at fasting as one of these disciplines. Kind of took, take a look at this. In Unger's Bible Dictionary, it explains that the word fast in the Bible is from the Hebrew word sum, which means to cover the mouth. In well, the New Testament, in the Greek, it comes from the word netesto, which means to abstain. So you cover your mouth, you abstain. So it's abstaining from eating and drinking is, is what Esther and her maids did. That's what they understood when they were talking about fasting. And they did so for three days. Well, in general, the Bible gives us an example of godly men and women and on different occasions combine fasting with praying. They've been praying already, but they're going to combine that and kind of intensify their prayers by adding a fast into it. And so kind of stir up their zeal and renew their dedication, their commitment to God. We, we see King David choose this discipline in psalms 35 and verse uh, 13 he said he humbled himself with fasting he's like god i i've got to bring something before you and and so i've got to remove every distraction in my life including eating because it's so important that i bring this and i want to humble myself because i i know that i am a, a human being that has faults and if I can pull some of that away and just lay myself out before you I want to humble myself by doing this fast so we don't fast to change God we fast so God can change us that's what this discipline is all about so let's look at three benefits of fasting if you choose to participate in this discipline number one fasting helps us to fight the desires of the flesh it's a way of saying that, God, you're more important to me than anything out there. And one of the things that you learn in the experience of fasting is how it kind of reveals what controls us. And I'm not just talking about food, but sometimes we can cover up some of the stuff that's happening in our heart because we cover that up with our eating and covering up with the sometimes when we come to the table. But when we remove that, it allows some of the stuff on the inside to kind of come out and allows us to kind of deal with some of that. So it brings it to the surface. You know, for the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, it, it was pride, it was self-righteousness, and it was also this unbelief in, the, Jew, in, the, in the, the story that was being circulated about Jesus. He had heard about all this, but he didn't want to give up his position. He had earned his position, and he had earned his right to be this authority in the Jewish community. And so Jesus was not a blessing. He was a threat. And so what did Saul do? He goes after Jesus. And he goes after Jesus' followers, people that are a threat unto him. And so that all changed with his dramatic encounter on the road to Damascus, where Jesus comes to Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Look at his response. Paul had to totally reboot Acts 9 and verse 8 says, Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they laid him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. 
this whole world has been turned upside down. And sometimes we've been there where we feel like everything that we know has somehow been, our, our apple cart's been knocked over and we carefully stacked it and then it falls over again. Oh, Paul, there's no cart around. There's no apples. Everything has been taken away. So for three days, he's like, okay, Lord, you've obviously got my attention. You've got plans for me. You've got this dream of what you want me to be. I, I'm going to take a step back for three days. I'm just going to fast and pray and say, Lord, open my eyes so I can see, not just physically, but so I can see spiritually. Lord, what do you have plans for me to do? Then Ananias comes to him in Acts 9, verse 18, and says, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. It was almost like he was starving out his old life. It's like, okay, I've been pursuing this with total passion and going at it with everything, and now you're telling me that that's wrong, that, that I, you want something else in my life, then I've got to starve out this old man. I've got to turn a new page. And so, Lord, I'm going to fast. I'm going to tear myself down physically and allow you to build me up into who you want me to be. Augustine of Hippo was best known for his spiritual autobiography, Confessions, and his philosophical work, The City of God. And some scholars have said he was arguably one of the most influential converts out, outside of Paul. And he was born in North Africa. His mother was a believer in Jesus, but his, his father was a pagan. And so Augustine rejected the message of Jesus. He followed after the, the footprints of his father. His mother was very concerned because she tried her best to reform her son from the life of his sexual excess. He had a long-standing liaison with one of the ladies in the village who had borne him a son. And she felt like that was keeping him from fully accepting the message of Jesus Christ. Well, it wasn't until years later when Augustine was serving as a professor in Milan that the bishop of Milan there spent time with him. He saw something. He introduced him and retold the story of Jesus and then he turned him on to some of the teachings of Paul and had him read through that. And finally, he decided he was going to give his life to the Lord. And both he and his son were baptized. And he's like, okay, I've been, I, I now see the gospel message. And, and I see how my life before was not living and honoring the Lord. How am I going to live differently? He decided he was going to give up everything and become a monk. Okay, well, how do you go from a very active sexual lifestyle to where anything goes to totally the other direction of becoming a monk? Here's what he writes. He said, prayer and fasting were his only defense. He said, in his fasting, therefore, let man rejoice inwardly in the very th fact that by this, his fasting, he is turning away from the pleasures of the world to make himself subject to Christ. Put another way, fasting is feasting. Feasting on God alone. He said, that, that's the only thing that's going get to me, get me through this. To turn a page on the old man and, and to become this new man I feel God is calling me to. Prayer and fasting is the only thing that can help me, to give me strength. And for those that, that have struggled with, for years with the same sins, you, you want to do better and, and you try, but you keep repeating these things. You know, Instead of just trying to get better, can we not make a decision to train to get better? Because if, if we can say, some, say no to something like food, something that we crave, something we're in the habit of doing over and over, does that not give us strength to say no to the desires of the flesh that just wage war within us? In a sense, fasting brings flesh into subjection to the Spirit that our spiritual life begins to trump and, 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 and turn up the volume on our spiritual life over the physical realm. The second thing that fasting helps us to do is to overcome the power of Satan. Overcome the power of Satan. Do you remember the, the story of Peter, James, and John? They were kind of the inner three that got the opportunity to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're up there. And Jesus just starts glowing. Who was up there with them? See, this is Elijah and Moses and they're just, oh, this is incredible. And Peter's like, we got building houses and all this stuff. And talk about a spiritual high. And they're up there on this mountain. And then, you know what happens when they come down on the other side? 
there's the rest of the disciples, and they're dealing with the situation. There's a man that has a, a young boy that uh, has thrown himself in the fire. He's controlled by, uh, by you know, a demon, and he's even possessed. And so they're trying to figure all this out. And the father comes to Jesus like, I, I, I took him over here to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. I thought they had power to kind of help us. But my son is still in the same condition. What do we do with this? Jesus said, well, bring the boy to me. And he heals him. Later on in private, the disciples are obviously kind of embarrassed. And they're like, Lord, we said the same things that we've heard you say in this same situation. How come we couldn't do it? Lord, I, I thought you gave us power to do this. Matthew 17 and verse 21, he responds, this kind of spirit can only be cast out with prayer and fasting. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, well, this kind can only be tackled by the Son of God, so you're kind of out of luck. No, what he's saying is, if your faith will increase, if it's even the side of a mustard seed, you can do incredible things. He said, there's hope for you. If you'll spend time in prayer and in fasting and allowing God to work on your spirit, there's power there, power to overcome sin in your life, and there's power to defeat what Satan is trying to do in this world. I desperately need those that are plugged into me that can be my spiritual representatives. There's so much work to be done. Satan is so active. I've got to have representatives here. Boys, you can do this. Spend time fasting and praying. Allow your faith to increase. Isn't that what Jesus did, knowing he was going to be having this showdown in the desert, knowing that the temptations would be very real? He spends 40 days in prayer and fasting, preparing for that encounter. And sure enough, the devil comes and offers him this food right there. Matthew 4 and verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God you know, and armed with the strength that comes from this discipline, Satan just says, I'm out. I have nothing that can go after this kind of power, this kind of resilience. And so it says that he walks away. You know, I talk with a lot of people that have been through moral collapse in their life. And, and very rarely does someone say, dude, I, I went out looking for this. I found it. I, I'm guilty. No, nine times out of ten, what they say is, I never saw this coming. This isn't something I was pursuing. I, I wasn't kind of nibbling at this. I was just there. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and I didn't have the strength to overcome this. There, there wasn't a depth within me that could keep me from doing what I said I would never do. That's what I'm talking about. Satan still controls so much territory in our lives and lives of our loved ones. We've got to be strong enough. And that comes from the Lord working on us, strengthening our spiritual core to resist Satan's schemes. Finally, fasting helps us to align ourselves with the Lord. Fasting makes it easier for us to hear the voice of God. Remember the story about what happened with the church in Antioch? We read it earlier. It said, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've been called, called them. So after they had fasted and prayed some more, they placed hands on them and sent them off. So the leaders of church are sensing something big is happening. God's putting on our heart that we need to be active and, and out there, and we've got to get this gospel message out. We've got a lot of good ideas to how we should do that. Well, we could send Joe or... Uh, you know, we, we could send uh, Thomas over here. Uh, well, what exactly should we do? I don't know. But instead of us just coming up with great ideas, let's take a step back. Let's pray about this. Let's offer it up to God. And let's fast about this so that our minds are totally centered in on this. We're going to spend so much time in prayer, we're not going to order out for food. We're, we're not going to take time for fellowship. We're just going to keep concentrating on this, waiting for the Lord to give us direction, waiting for the Lord to provide waiting for the Lord to confirm what is his desire for us to do. And then there's the story of, Sin, of Cornelius, a member of the Italian regiment stationed in Caesarea, Centurion. The text depicts him as a God-fearing man. And, and so it said that he prayed regularly. 
The text also said that he was known for the alms he gave to the poor. He was a good guy. For years he had done this. People knew that he was a good, God-fearing guy. So we have Cornelius. He receives a vision in which the angel of God tells him that his prayers have been heard. Then the angel instructs Cornelius to send men from his household over to Joppa and even tells him the name of the house. As soon as the guy down by the sea, there's a, a guy I want you to go talk with. Go ask for Peter and tell him I said for him to pack up his things and come over. Meanwhile, Peter's getting his own vision of sorts. But there's going to be a group coming, and this is of me. Cornelius is going to be this first convert of the Gentile people that <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't be here today. So this is what's happening. Why this vision? Why this visit from the angel? Acts 10 and verse 30. Peter arrives and he says, okay, you've told me to come. What am I doing here? And Cornelius is like, I don't know. God told me to have you come here. So they've kind of got this standoff. Why am I here? I don't know. Well, I, I was told to bring you here. You're supposed to fill in those blanks. But he kind of tells a story. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. I'm not saying that we fast is going to guarantee an angel's going to show up in our midst. But something was different. Something Cornelius could sense that God was doing something in his life. And so he just says, I'm going to hold off on food for a while so that I can figure this out. I, I, I want to lay everything before. But Cornelius had been praying and serving the poor for years, but apparently it wasn't enough. He was hungering for more. So he desires to know God deeper, even if that meant passing on the food that was put before him. Think of it this way. If we can turn up the volume on what God is trying to tell us, Sometimes we have to turn down the volume on the food and the other needs that, that our body tells us that we need. I'm going to ask Dave Stewart to come up. Dave's a member of our small group, and uh, Dave has been doing this spiritual discipline. And we went around and each picked one. Uh, Dave was the only one that stepped up to do fasting, so I agreed to, to do it with him. So he and I had spent some time fasting in the month of May. So... Uh, Dave, tell us just a little bit about what you chose to do, maybe why you chose, and then what you ended up doing. Um, yeah, I chose it more for because uh, when it comes to food and things like that, it, it you know, it kind of, you know, would rule our lives and, mm -hmm. and uh, or the uh, just bad food, you know, really. Okay. Uh, and that's where I kind of went with it to begin with. Of, okay, maybe I can cleanse my body of, of these things and not really knowing what, was going to come out of this um and the way that we did it was uh instead of going full bore we did one day a week and then the next week added a day and so on and so forth through the month okay so we get up to a, a three-day fast mm -hmm. and that's completely different than just skipping a meal like we did week one right mm -hmm. and even uh skipping a whole day on week two and then Two days was difficult on three. Uh, but talk about that last week, what it meant as you're heading into a three-day fast. You're not going to have anything but, but water. What, what's right. that like as you're going through it in your mind? Um, for, for me, it was a, I felt really focused, uh, okay. strangely. I, you know, at doing that for the first day or so, uh, smells really stood out to you and, and, um, and, and things like that. But for some reason, I was I, I felt really focused. But I mean, all, all my other senses were kind of fiery in all, all cylinders um, during that time. Now, now I didn't just do water only. I I, I did have some caffeine. Um, okay. uh, he he went caffeine free, right? But uh, and then, uh, the, the, yeah. that was actually more difficult than skipping food. Yeah. Is not having. Uh, <laughs> how many of y'all have have morning coffee? Oh, and, and it's how many of you have more than one cup in the morning? Yeah, and so. <laughs> I would see Steve walking to go get the pot going. I'd, hey, Steve, you know? And so, yeah, and so caffeine is, is not just something your body asks for, but it's a routine. Right, yeah. And, and, and so food is a part of that as well. And, and, and the main reason why I didn't do that was just because I suffer from migraines, and when I don't have caffeine for a long time, it just it, it makes it tough for me And when I have to work and all that. And maybe next time I do this, I'll go caffeine-free. But uh. Okay, but... Uh, <laughs> I, 
I, I know for me that as you go throughout the month, I mean, you, as you're going different week to week, as going throughout the month, that the longer that you spend fasting, the more messages your body keeps reminding you, dude, you got to go get food. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I was lucky in that, um, uh, you know, even though my body was screaming like that, but uh, I was extremely busy. And okay. so, you know, a lot of times I would just not even think about it. Um, when you got those yeah. impulses right. to go, do you just dismiss it or do you use that as a reminder saying, right. okay, God, I'm doing this for a spiritual reason? Yeah. Um, I, I prayed more than I ever had in my life. I've never, I've never been a big uh, um, prayer or um, I, I didn't pray a lot. And, um, and, and so I took that time to, I had to pray a whole lot more. And, uh, um, it's kind of amazing how it did change my life, and I guess we can get into that in, here in a little bit. But Okay, now you're in the middle of your three-day fast, mm -hmm. and yeah. so you're offering this up to God, and you kind of feel like, Lord, look, I'm, I'm really right. doing this, and then your world kind of comes apart. Share yeah. with them briefly what, what took place during the middle of your three-day fast. Yeah, right. um, the, but with a half day left, uh, I lost my job, and uh, it was unexpected, and um, the, the strange thing about all that was um, I felt oddly at peace with it. Okay. Um, and I just kind of knew that it would be taken care of somehow. Um, and, you know, you, you're going over your three points um, uh, for the lesson. Actually, I think I went through all three of these um, through this time period. And, and so it just didn't end there for me because, um, like I said, I started praying a lot more and uh, during the fast, and then um, afterwards, I kept it up. And uh, so while I, uh, um, the, the second point is to help us overcome the power of Satan, well, um, Tracy asked me, or was concerned about me because of all this, and uh, because if this would have happened maybe three or four years ago, yeah, I pro it would have probably been bad for, for me. Devastating. Yes, and... Um, and, and, and even though I was thankfully out of work for only a month, that, that whole time I was just at, at peace with it. I, I mean, I had anxious times, and I was, there was, I was pretty sure at some point that we would have to move because with all the sequestration stuff going on around here, the, a lot of the work just dried up. Okay, and, now before, before yes. you get to the result, yes. did you ever wrestle with that this is a spiritual battle you're going through. And that if you're presenting, there's two ways of looking at it, mm -hmm. that you're presenting to God, I want to be more disciplined, and I'm giving up of this food, and then Satan comes at you and says, oh yeah, well let, let me tell you how I can humble you more. Mm -hmm. I, I guess another way for me to look at it is, God is encouraging you to do this, knowing what's about to happen, to strengthen you to get right. through this. Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it, it it did strengthen me for this, this you know, to uh, prepare me for this because I I think if I wasn't going through this at the time and this happened, it would that would have also been a, um, it would have hard for me to take it. And so, you know, it it changed my mindset of of um, you know, even though I've been a Christian for since I was 11, um, I don't know if I ever became uh, converted. You know what I mean? Okay. It, and um, and it was hard for me. To, my entire life to trust in God and to um, let go of what I think I can do for myself. And fasting helped you to do that? Yeah, yeah, I think so, because it, it, um, uh, with, with Tracy doing her thing and, and the rest of our small group doing things, it, it uh, I guess it was breaking me down, and um, I'm, I'm not all the way there yet, but I'm a lot farther than I was. Okay, and yeah. so fill in the rest of the story about your employment and everything. Oh, sure. And so, um, um, yeah, so, so I thought for sure we were going to have to move uh, just to, to have a job. And um, I was flying out to Wichita uh, for, for an interview. And when I got off the plane, I turned my, my phone back on, and I just had all these messages. And uh, a couple of them was from a company up in Franklin, Tennessee, which... That would be good because not too far away. Uh, but another one was from a company here in town uh, about a position. And the other, uh, um, uh, 
and, and the other message was from my old government boss. And basically what happened when I got a hold of them is there was a new position that came open in, in, uh, uh, in some of the area where I used to be at. And the government boss recommended me to this company. And essentially the company said, his word's good enough for ours. You don't even have to interview. The job's yours. And, right. uh, um, and so I, I, I kind of sat on it for, for a little bit because I didn't know what to think about all that. And, uh, um, but I, I started a couple weeks ago, thankfully, and, and, uh, um, and I was able to move on. But um, w one of the things that when I, uh, um, even before this started, my, my whole concept of worship and the body and all that kind of stuff has been kind of thrown up on its head. And um, um, at, at the time, I was looking at Romans chapter 12. And, you know, in, uh, in verse 1, it says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, um, the kind he, he will accept. And when he thinks of, or, or when you think of what he has done for you, is it too much to ask? And then I think in the New American Standard, it says that this is your spiritual worship. And, and I, you know, I kind of look at that. That's, that's the discipline of worship there is, is right there in, in chapter 12. And then, but, you know, if you keep on reading, Verse 13 says, be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and always be prayerful. And, and I had read that like right around the time that this happened. And um, thankfully I, I did because I was, the old Dave probably would have fought this in a different way. Right. And uh, maybe even fallen away or hated God. I, I, I don't know what I would have done, but I don't think I would have had the same reaction as I did um, uh, with 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 this fast, can, can you recommend fasting as a discipline to help you? Oh yeah, I, I mean I, I I plan on doing it again some sometime. And um, one thing that um, that that I made sure of was when I did this fast, and you know we did this during the week. And and one thing I I, I didn't want to do was do it to where I had to tell people I was doing a fast. You know, on the weekends you're you know more likely to go out to eat with people or something. And and I didn't want to make someone else uncomfortable or um, act like I'm a show off. I, sure. I, I guess so, you know, doing, doing this during the middle of the week made a lot easier, and then, you know, lunch at work time, you know, you can just kind of slide off, uh, you know, away from, from everybody else. And Because uh, the last thing I wanted to do was let people know I was doing it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, Brother Barry brought it up in class to, uh, today, too, of, uh, you know, the, the Pharisees and all this stuff, you know, being on, on the street corner and showing what, what, what they're doing. And I don't think any of these disciplines um, are best served if we try to do, do it that, that, that way. And yeah, the, the last thing I, I, I would share is there was something about doing it in community, mm -hmm. knowing that you and I are going to be fasting on most of the same days. There were times yeah. where you're gone on a trip or whatever that our schedule was a little bit different, but just knowing there was someone across town that's right. doing the exact same thing at lunch that I was doing. You know? Right, yeah, and exactly. And, and the day that I lost my job, um, Brad uh, I, I, he either texted me or called me and I was also coaching a baseball game so it was, it was, a, it was a long day, a tough day and, and uh, he, he goes, How, how's it going? I said, well I lost my job <laughs> and I, what? And, and, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm glad he was there to, um, at, at that point to understand what I was going through um, and, 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 and to be able to support me through, through that time yeah. So Dave, our appreciation thank you for sharing your story good stuff Matthew 6 and verse 16 says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they've received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so they will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who's unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Three takeaways from this passage that Jesus is telling us about fasting. The first is, there's an expectation from time to time we're going to fast. This passage wasn't debating on, well, should we or should we not? Jesus just saying, well, when you do it, and, and for some to say, well, I don't know, you know, if we should do that or not. Well, the passage before us is when you pray, we don't kind of weigh on that. Why not give it a try? There's an expectation. We're going we're gonna to experiment with this. Number two, when you fast, don't do it to appear more spiritual to others. Dave just, just talked about that, that we do it in, in such a way that people don't even know what we're doing. Because there, there is a tendency for us to have pride. There is a tendency for us to, 
to think ourselves more spiritual than the others that, that don't participate in these disciplines. And, and when it becomes an external thing, well, it is truly just a work. Instead, number three, passionately pursue God in secret. Make it an internal thing which is just between you and God. Our Heavenly Father so desperately wants us to spend time with Him. Our Father wants us to desperately know Him. So that's when you're going to find your reward. You know, when we fast, essentially what we're telling God is, that's what I want to. I, I want to spend time with you. I, I want our prayer life to be more frequent and be more intense because of this hunger that's going on in my belly. I, I want to know you more. That's what we're communicating. Now, I need to give a little disclaimer. Not everyone health-wise can, can do a, a long three-day fast or, or longer. Please talk with your doctor. But I, I think everyone can skip a meal. And if, if you can't, no, I have to have so many calories. There are certain, certain foods you can skip and, and other things, uh, other things you can give up. It, it's a matter of messing up your schedule. It's a matter of messing up what's going on in here to make us focus on what's internally important. Let's pray together. Father, we, we really do want to know your will. We want to know you better. Lord, teach us to examine our faults, to see where um, Lord, we're, we're falling short of your glory. And give us the strength to overcome these faults. Lord, make us more like your son, Jesus. Make us more holy. Lord, give, give us the power to see what's happening. Lord, I, I know I'm guilty of not seeing the spiritual battle all around us. Lord, give us eyes to see. See what's happening. See what you're doing in this world, but also to see the ways that that Satan is operating and give us the, the power to resist these temptations. And Lord, lead us. There's so many things you would have us to do in the time that you've given us. Lord, help us be kingdom proclaimers. Lord, I pray that the things that we will experience for all of eternity, we can get glimpses of now and point people towards the reality of the way that we're living. Lord, give us the, the courage the desire, and the strength to pursue you with everything we have. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.